Welcome back to season three of The Cult of Christianity. I've been a busy boy since last we spoke, as has the United States. Uh, Personally, I am now officially working on my master's in journalism through NYU. Um, The podcast also grew over the summer, and I've booked some amazing guests for this season. Uh, As far as housekeeping goes, this is a reminder that this is the third season of the pod, so if you're a purist, scroll back, uh, perhaps find episodes that cover topics that are interesting to you, or just feel free to start here. Um, During the summer and fall, I continue to buy two other shows, Parsing Propaganda, where I critique Christian content, and Amateur Religious Trauma Therapy, where I speak candidly about how I view my own religious trauma and what I've learned through self-reflection and therapy. Those uh, were coming out once a month for the break in between seasons. Um, But before that, I was uh, releasing those shows once a week. Uh, Well, this season, art will still be weekly on Thursdays, but Parsing Propaganda will now be monthly simply because my workload um, in class is limiting my time. But inflation does not exist here. For $5 a month still, subscribers through Spotify and Anchor get access to almost 50 episodes at this point of those shows, um, as well as uh, the continuation of other projects um, throughout the season, um, as well as what I'm doing, continuing those shows this season. Uh, Thank you for those who have already subscribed. (laughs) Um, It helps more than you could possibly know. Uh, Also, for those who can't afford $5 a month um, but still want to support this work, you can now support me with as little as a dollar a month um, just through listener support. I know that doesn't sound like much, but if even half my listeners gave me 99 cents a month, I could quit door dashing for extra cash and make this my full-time job, which is it's a little bit the dream. Um, So I don't like asking for y'all's hard-earned money. Uh, But the reality is advertising dollars are not a sustainable uh, financial model for podcasting at this point. So one dollar from you a month could keep the show alive beyond a third season. um, And without more support, uh, I can't guarantee that'll happen. So again, five dollars a month gets you more hours of more content. One dollar a month keeps the show alive. And you can find links for all this in the show description. So the day after I released my last episode, uh, my last real episode of season two, it was titled Religious Freedom, talking about how uh, that term is a dog whistle for theocratic tyranny. Uh, That day after I released that episode, the Roe v. Wade decision was leaked, and then a month later it became officially reversed. And I've been wanting to cover the topic of abortion since I created this podcast, uh, but wanted to find the right guest to speak on it, and guess what? I found her. So, let's get right into it, and as always, thank y'all for listening, and please enjoy. Hi there, friend. My name is John Verner. I used to be a part of the largest cult in the United States. After studying the Bible, Christian history, and ministry, I set my sights on confronting the problematic nature of white evangelicalism in the United States. In 2019, I published my first book as a first step in addressing the subtle issues of this complex system. This podcast will continue that work under the same title. Welcome to The Cult of Christianity. Content warning. While the cult of Christianity often deals with tough subjects regarding religious trauma and other triggering topics, some episodes may be more explicit than others. This episode contains content that may be distressing to some listeners. This may include multiple mentions of self harm, suicide, sexual abuse, or other intense concepts. Please only listen if you are in the headspace to do so. Take care of yourself. On today's show, we have Asha Dea. She is a film producer, TEDx speaker, and journalist who has done work for ABC, MSN, MTV, and many more. She is the founder and editor-in-chief of Girl Talk HQ, uh, which is a global platform and community focused on amplifying the voices and stories of everyday women. She is the author of today's Wonder Women, Everyday Superheroes Who Are Changing the World, and is amidst producing a documentary I'm very excited to see, titled Someone You Know. 
Asha, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, John. It's great to be speaking with you today. Yeah, it's an honor to have you here. I, I admire your work so much, so I'm so glad you uh, agreed to come on. Yeah, thank you. The, uh, the, the first question I ask virtually every guest is, uh, how did you relate to Christianity the first 18 years of your life? Oh, minimum 18 years. Um, I was born into a family that identified as Christian, and my parents still do. I was born in the UK, moved to Australia when I was eight uh, with my family, obviously, um, and was raised in... Uh, I wouldn't call it conservative evangelical. It was just evangelical. I didn't really know the word conservative at that point. It was just we're Christian and we go to church and we sing songs and we raise our hands and do all the things. And uh, that was just an indelible part of my identity growing up. I didn't know anything different. You know, we read the Bible. We prayed before every meal. We read the Bible before we went to bed. We went to church every Sunday, youth group on Fridays midweek Bible study on Wednesdays, church retreats, church camps, Bibles, ongoing like seven-week Bible studies that would happen before church services on Sundays and all the things that a lot of people identify with growing up in that world. Um, so that was, I would say, the first 30 years. Of, I'm almost 40. So it was roughly 30 years of my life. Um, and, yeah, it was just like part of who I was, part of my identity, and it wasn't until – various events in my life. Um, there were political events, which I, I'm sure a lot of people can identify with, um, specifically in the year 2016 and thereabouts, but also going through a divorce and moving to America in 2009 and really learning the difference between just, you know, nominal evangelical Christianity that didn't involve politics in Australia and the UK, at least when I was growing up, versus moving to America in the year 2009, which was a major year politically and socially and then really learning firsthand that, oh, being an evangelical in America means being very political. And so that was all very new to me, but it, it was something I just immediately took on and assumed it was the thing you do because the thread through all of that is the community and the quote-unquote fellowship and, you know, the family that becomes your family um, just by way of being in the same church or organization. And and so for me, it was less about the political and the social things that were happening. It's just like, oh, this is my family. This is my community. If I don't have these people, I don't have anything. I don't have any support system. So come hell or high water, I'm going to be part of it. So that was the first 30 years of my life. And um, it's been an interesting and very liberating experience not being part of that, but also a, a struggle at times, which I'm sure we'll get into. So that's in a nutshell who I who I am and how I grew up and my religious background. I'm always so curious when somebody grew up in what could be defined as evangelicalism outside of the U.S., um, just because it's, it's, you know, indelibly American in some ways, right? Yes. Um, but... I, I'm curious, did, with the word evangelical specifically, in your head, was it just Christianity or was it like a specific a specific subset of Christianity? Because for me, growing up, like it would be the word evangelical would be brought up in, in a positive light. You know, um, we are an evangelical church. Um, did did you have like any specific specificness to uh, to that word or was it just kind of Christianity? It was definitely a specific brand, and now I would call it a brand of Christianity because I grew up in a church that was part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Australia, which is an American-founded um, movement. And so we were very much about supporting missionaries. And we were a really small church, but, yeah, we were very missions-focused. Um, and so evangelical, the word to me, meant supporting the people that were going around the world to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and so that's what it meant to be an evangelical. But for me personally, it was always so intimidating to think, oh, my God, what if what if I'm going to be, you know, God's going to call me and force me to go out into a place that I don't want to go. And it was always very, it was like neutral to me seeing other people do it and the church supporting these missionaries. And it seemed great. But then whenever I think about myself and I'm like, oh, my God, I don't. please don't ever call on me. I don't ever want to do that. I don't like talking about it. I don't know how to 
evangelize. I don't know how to do any of that. So it was a very specific type of Christianity, yeah. And and we visited other churches here and there and, you know, like we would visit the more Pentecostal, like the Hillsong types and it felt, I don't know, it felt cool at the time because I was young and there was cool music and it was bigger and there were more young people. And so it was, it was interesting to see the different types of Christianity out there and in Australia and, and you know, here in America as well. But it was, yeah, it was definitely specifically tied to that idea of missionary work and also literally taking advantage of every moment you can to spread the gospel, so to speak. And that was always very intimidating and, and frightening to me. It is fascinating how that word, I mean, the root word is obviously evangelizing, right? So you would yeah. think evangelicals would be defined by that. And I would say in some ways they really were for a long period of time, so, which is why it's interesting, you know, in the more recent years to see them more defined by their exclusivity um, than, their, than their evangelizing, which is very interesting, um, just social commentary. So, you know, as we're talking about this, it's evident, you know, we neither you or I would identify as evangelicals anymore. No, not anymore. So, so uh, when did you start to leave the faith, and and maybe what were some of the questions that maybe led to you leaving? Yeah, that's um, it was a process for me. It wasn't like one particular thing. It was a series of things. Um, the the first being that I when I moved to America, um, I fell in love with a guy as things happen people fall in love and I was young and it was he was part of the church that I was going to um, here in Los Angeles um, yes there are very conservative enclaves even in Los Angeles um, and so for me it was just like great I met a Christian we fell in love we're gonna get married and that's what you do and everything else will fall into place and I was given just such bad advice about marriage and relationship it was all about you know the the religious aspect there was no sense of like you know, find out what each other, how you think about money or how you think about family relation to, relationships to your families and what are your career goals and, you know, things about children and blah, blah, blah. It was none of that. It was just you're a Christian, you think the same, you believe the same, great. Everything else is going to be fine. It's it's workoutable. Um, and it, it just was not that at all. And so that marriage ended up being abusive in a number of different ways. And so I decided at the age of 29 to leave. Um, and for anyone who's part of the, who has previously been part of this world, especially a woman, um, would know that make me making the decision, decision to leave the marriage and also the church because he worked at the church um, and it was a big church and I was very, very involved. So I had to leave. Um, it, making that decision on my own was so difficult and nobody in that church supported me. And it was hard because I was involved in the worship team. I was in, I was leading Bible study. I would volunteer at women's ministries. I was doing all the things. Um, and I thought I had all these friends. And this is a 5,000 member church. But the minute that I left and stepped back from all those ministries, not one person reached out to me. And, and the, the only people that did randomly were people that I, a couple of men that I didn't even really know who had said to me, Oh, Asha, you should stay with your husband because God said this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, off. Um, you know, now I can say that, but at the time it was terrifying because, you know, when that's all your community and no one's reaching out to support you and the only people that reach out to you tell you you should be doing this, it's scary, it's terrifying. And But the thing that helped me stick to my decision was that my parents in Australia, who are also Christian, but they're not overly political, they're just, they live their lives and they love people and they love their community they supported my decision because I told them what was going on and they kind of suspected things, but I was just too afraid as is what usually happens in abusive relationships. I was too afraid to tell anyone because I thought it would reflect badly on me and I felt shame because of that. And so because they supported me, I thought, right, I'm going to continue on with it. And also at the time I had a job, um, I'm a producer in Hollywood. And so I was working on a TV show behind the scenes and I had kind of let slip to some of my friends that, you know, my marriage is not so great and they had, you know, been supporting me and, and giving me good advice. And so that kind of bolstered me a little bit to think that, all right, I'm not totally crazy by thinking that I should step away from an abusive situation. And so that was probably the biggest catalyst for me. So I, I left that church and then I moved to a different part of Los Angeles and 
I started going to a different church, a vineyard church, which is a little bit smaller, and the people were lovely and they weren't as overly political. Um, but then as time went on, you know, we were getting closer to the 2016 election. And so in the lead up to that with, you know, as most people would remember, Donald Trump becoming the Republican and by de facto the quote-unquote Christian candidate, it was just so absurd that all these evangelicals, conservatives and Christians that I knew who would have no doubt hated on someone like Bill Clinton who had an affair and who took advantage of his position of power, now they're falling in line for someone like Donald Trump who is just so crass and went against everything that they valued and that they would force on young women like me in the church, you know, uh, how dare I get divorced? Meanwhile, they're supporting a candidate who's been divorced how many times? Three, four times? And it was just so absurd to me. That that was like my decision to divorce the church, I think, that throughout, throughout 2015 and 2016. And then I think the thing that sealed the deal for me was the whole abortion issue. You know, I'd never really thought much about it. I'd never really had an opinion. Uh, but I just knew that being... A conservative evangelical meant you were quote unquote pro life, and I didn't look into it or research it. It was just like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm against abortion. I'm pro life, um, and I would see all my you know fellow peers at church, especially young people, like stand on stage and say all these things and pontificate about abortion and all this kind of stuff. And it was only men from the pulpit preaching on why you should be pro life. But then when I left the church and left that kind of whole movement and started changing my views and I would share different articles on Facebook and social media and I would get pushback from people from my former church which was expected but then secretly you know in DMs I would get people reach out to me saying oh thank you for sharing that article I've actually had an abortion I can't tell anyone and I was part of an abusive situation as well and um because I'd shared that um publicly and um you know, some people told me they had multiple abortions and I'm like, wait, hang on, what is going on right now? And so, you know, my divorce and the leaving the church was the main things for me, but then the abortion issue really made me become more forward thinking and progressive and really shift the way I thought about certain issues and have a solidified opinion on certain issues that I didn't have before, that I was just kind of taught by proxy to believe whether it was on immigrants or race or you know um slavery or abortion like all those th- marriage gender roles all those things were just kind of heaped on me as a young christian but now for the first time after leaving all that i was able to figure out for myself what i believed by doing research by listening to people and researching it and just learning more about an issue that i had never really bothered to you know, take an interest in it was just like, oh yeah, this is the position of the church. Uh huh. Okay, that's me. Cool. Let's move on with our lives, and that's not me anymore. And so that's that was my turning point. And you know, for in many ways, I I still am on a journey. Like I definitely don't call myself Christian. I wouldn't consider myself religious. I'm open to spirituality, but I'm not dogmatic. I'm not black and white. It's like I'm curious and interested interested to learn how other people live out their expression of faith and spirituality. But I'm not. So, oh, I have to be in this camp or this position or this identity. It's much more freeing to be able to define it for myself or not. Well, so much of what you said is uh, what the kids call relatable content. Um, because <laughs> uh, f- for me, I, I, I would, I, I think you and I might share this, this um, plot point. Divorce wasn't what made me leave Christianity, but it was definitely like a... Um, maybe an (laughs) etch-a-sketch of just being like shaken up a little and like being like okay i need to reevaluate how i've been living not necessarily in like a shameful way like there was i mean for me i was doing things very wrong in my life but like but not not in like a condemnation way just more in a my thought process has been almost entirely scripted by people i've given authority over me right and and i used to think i was pretty contrarian and and pretty you know independent Dang. i always thought i was a rebel but i was not <laughs> yeah yeah you have this you might have a sense because it, it might be in just our personality to be a little bit rebellious but like w- what was controlling my mind <laughs> quite literally yeah. was pastors yeah. who i didn't even like half the time 
and and that that you know divorce i don't i don't know if it's just such a life altering event that it makes you reevaluate things um but it's not so much that the divorce was like oh i'm divorced i guess jesus isn't it real you know that that wasn't the the thought process at all um but it was definitely a plot point for me which i'm i'm hearing it was for you too yeah yeah and also yeah th- there were so much so many good things you said but it is interesting how sometimes there can be a specific issue. So like for me, a, a big issue was um, my best friend came out to me as trans while I was in Bible college. Oh, wow. And so that was something that, um, you know, I never reacted with hate. I never hated her at all. But I was in an environment that was teaching me to hate mm. her. And I was like, well, what do I do? And so like that kind of became a very um, awakening issue uh, so it's interesting for you that abortion was almost the thing that that you were able to kind of latch on. Am, am I hearing your story yeah. correct there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it was the issue that, I mean, I hate to use this term, but I felt like I was called <laughs> to it just through my experience leaving that church. But also it's such a monumental issue and not in the way that it's been defined by politics or American religion, but it's monumental because the more I study it and learn about it and listen to the experts, it's, it is so the, uh, the, the right to make decisions about your life and your body and a pregnancy is so huge. And for anyone to take any ounce of that control away from you is massive. And it is so life changing and devastating in many, in many ways. And so the more that I think about it, it's like, it is so much bigger than a political talking point. It is the fundamental right to have autonomy over your life. It's not just about abortion. It's about how you how we're allowed to identify ourselves and how we're allowed to move freely in the world and what we're allowed to do and who we're allowed to be. It's it's connected to so many things. And so, yeah, it's it's still that issue that keeps me coming back to that idea of, okay, well, I've got this is the issue that I need to um, – be you know incorporate my work with and I feel very drawn to in so many ways because of not just that aspect of my life in in the past but also where I am now today as a mother and being married again and you know going through two pregnancies and two childbirths and and realizing what a monumental um issue it is and so yeah that's it's definitely still an issue in my life well, thank you for sharing so much. It, I, I love when people are willing to be vulnerable and, and kind of share where they came from, because I think it it not only gives credence to, um, you know, an opinion that some evangelicals would think is, you know, abhorrent, but it also like paints a picture that this isn't something you casually believe. This is something that's very important and, sh- and shows a lot of um, empathy for our, our fellow hum- humankind. You know, for many years, well, well, let's let's get deeper into the abortion issue, quote unquote. For many years, people would say that the abortion debate hinges on whether the fetus is a human life. In fact, that was really what Roe v. Wade, in a lot of ways, spent the most time on, um, even even if that wasn't what was written in their conclusion originally. Do you think that's the linchpin of abortion discussions in, in your worldview? No. Uh, and that's not to say that those discussions and those viewpoints are not valid because they are. But the thing is, there is no one consensus, not in every religion. Even in one religion, people have different points of view. Um, there is no medical consensus because at, uh, you know, throughout the nine months of pregnancy, anything could happen. And that's why we have ultrasounds every few weeks. That's why you have checkups because pregnancy is such a, there's so many things going in your body and it takes a million things to come together correctly for it to go smoothly. But it takes one thing to potentially go off course that something could go wrong. So all of that to say that discussions about morality and whether someone believes a fetus is a human being at this point or this week or that point is not the issue. For me now, the issue is do I look at someone else and say, you have the right and dignity to make the best decisions for you because you know best about your life? And that is it. And that's honestly where I draw the line because having gone through that twice, for anyone to come up to me at that point and say, oh, oh, I see you're however many weeks along. So what are you going to do now? What's, what decision are you going to make if you get this diagnosis? It's, I would have been like, 
look all the way off. Who are you? Do not make any decisions about me or my life. You don't know anything about me. And so, and I'm not saying you have to go through a pregnancy to believe that, but that was just my journey. But for me, the, it's less about the debate over abortion and it's less about what morality people ascribe to it because everyone approaches it differently. It's about whether you have the right to make that decision for yourself um, in the in the freedom that you need and with the support that you choose rather than having people intrude and force their opinions and morality and perspectives on you. So it's just, yeah, it's it's never, there's so many things you can debate about abortion, the science, the, the uh, morality, the religion, the politics, this and that. And the thing is, there is no one um, medical consensus. There is no one political consensus. And so when we have that such a scattershot landscape, how can we tell everyone to think the same? And so, you know, even Roe v. Wade was always meant to be the floor, not the ceiling. It was always meant to be a starting point. And unfortunately, now that's been taken away. And so now we have to redefine that, you know, what is, what is the basic um, understanding of how we um, afford reproductive autonomy to people. And that's now being defined again all over from scratch in 2022. So, yeah, I, I don't think morality is the end point discussion when it comes to abortion. I certainly agree now, and I certainly used to not, <laughs> you know, um, and that's what the, 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 only, the biggest the biggest thing I wrestle with on that is just is just a man. I wish we couldn't could talk to each other and not past each other sometimes. But the, mm. the bottom line is, um, you know, kind of the, the way I've I've kind of settled it in my own heart, just like how could I have believed one thing and believe something so radically different now? is kind of being like okay it is a human life it's still in someone's body you know that's that's not necessarily yeah. you know we <laughs> most laws in the US let people let you shoot people if they come on your property um that's oh much God, less exactly, exactly. an invasion of your body <laughs> you know um so i yeah. i think that does bring some clarity to whether whether that's relevant or not i i do think it, it can be interesting to to have those discussions but but i do agree it's probably not the linchpin of of the discussion there's probably yeah. Yeah, autonomy could be a big one and also just like health care right yeah and and you know and that's not to say that morality shouldn't be discussed and i think it depends on who the person is i mean some people like having those discussions and that's great but ultimately the way I think about it now is I, I don't debate anyone on abortion. I don't I go on social media. I've done that a little bit in the past, but also it's like this is such a waste of time because neither the person or I that are having this exchange are going to change each other's minds. Furthermore, there are people out there getting abortions right now who are not consulting with me about my opinion. So why does it matter about this stupid argument that I'm having? Um, and I think they're the, the most well-meaning pro-choice people and People in the reproductive justice movement and leaders are always willing to admit that, yes, this is the potential for a human life. But the fact that it's not a fully formed and born alive human like you or I yet, um, it, there are so many things that are happening along the way that it's, it's such a private and personal and vulnerable time in someone's life, in a pregnant person's life, that there is no way that one law or one perspective can cover all the things that could potentially go wrong or that potentially covers all the things that are part of a person's life. We don't know what someone's financial status is, what their mental health is like, what their support system is like. You know, are they in a domestic violence situation? Are they, you know, do they have a job right now? Are they stable? You know, all those things that none of us have any idea about. And so that's why for me, then morality ends up being the lowest on the totem pole because that's like, oh, I have the privilege to discuss morality about abortion because I'm not in any of those situations. And so I hope that makes sense. But yeah, I think morality is an interesting thing to discuss, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't actually impact someone who's going to get an abortion right now. Like no one stands outside of a, an abortion clinic and, and says to someone going in like, Hey, let's debate morality. Like, no, that person is thinking about their life, their potential children at home, their education, their health, 
no, then they're, they're not thinking about, oh, let me, let me first debate with a Republican senator before I go into this clinic and, and make the best decision for my life, you know? No, I think that's, I think that's so important because there's, there's a practicality, um, it's not even an issue it's kind of central to to the whole discussion right um is is what what does having a child ensue because it's not like you have a child and the child raises itself (laughs) um there's a whole environment they're born into and there's a whole responsibility a large responsibility that comes with that so you know abortion just means aborting a pregnancy right and there could be a lot of reasons someone wants or needs to terminate a pregnancy um in in the work you've done obviously you've been kind of in this space for a long time what what has popped out as some of the most common reasons that that people get abortions yeah i mean abortion simply is terminating a pregnancy and i think for me the and there's so much data out there you know the, the gut marker institute is a great place to um, look up uh, data, peer-reviewed data. Every year they release, uh, I think it's every year, every couple of years they release really great um, studies on so many different aspects of abortion. Um, and in terms of the reasons, the, the, I kind of have a problem with discussing reasons because it means that we're subconsciously creating a good column and a bad column. It's you know, we say, oh, well, here are the reasons. Well, some people do it for medical reasons and we and we immediately go, our heart goes out to them. It's, oh, we, those, are the, those are the pity stories and, yes, that they should be having all the access they need. And then you hear, you know, rhetoric being thrown around like, oh, you know, these slots just getting abortion, using it as birth control. It's like, oh, those are the bad abortions. And I'm using that as a completely made-up scenario because that is not the majority. The majority of people who get abortions, it's better to look at um, the the demographics of who accesses abortion, who needs it. The majority of people who get abortions in America are already parents, 60%. Um, that's huge. They're already mothers. They're people like me who, you know, who already have children at home. And so they're making these decisions for very, very specific reasons. Um, you know, for people who are parents out there, you know how hard parenting is and to then make a decision about a pregnancy that is either not viable or you're not able to keep is a very big and monumental choice to make and or not for some people it's easier um but it's very personal and so for me when i look at the demographics it's majority people of color um which also ties into the socioeconomic status of uh, marginalized people and minorities in this country and the access to healthcare that we may or may not have um, it's uh, majority mothers, like I said, and so we look at the landscape of, well, why don't we have a national paid leave policy and why is childcare so unaffordable and why does the wage gap still exist and we still have a lot of gender bias out there in many different industries in so many different ways and when you look at the wage gap, it's not the, you know, between men and women, it's the motherhood gap that is the biggest So there's this, you know, the quote-unquote motherhood penalty, which you can look up. There are numerous financial reports and studies about how when you become a mother, your wage um, gets impacted so much more than um, all all the other demographics of um, women who are affected by the wage gap overall. And so once you start to realise the demographics of who accesses abortion, and by the way, religious people are a massive part of the overall abortion-seeking population, um, let's put that out there, and that includes conservatives. Um, it's it, then you start to realize, oh, abortion is not just an issue; it happen that happens by itself in its own little silo over here. It is connected to our financial status, our access to healthcare, our, um, our education status, our um, our job status, and and all these different things, our mental health and our support system, and 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 for me, that's much more important than the reasons because. Everyone's reason for getting an abortion is so personal and it's their own and it's frankly none of my business. And I know that sounds very cliched or cookie cutter, but it really is the truth. You know, I, if, and I personally have not had an abortion, but if I were to have made that decision, I wouldn't want to have to justify it to anyone else. And, and so that's the danger with discussing abortion reasons. It's we're subconsciously allowing the discourse to be put into the right and wrong abortions and, and you know, also subconsciously saying to people that, oh, you need to justify your decisions to the public 
so that we can create these narratives and then weaponize them in political debates or from the pulpits or on social media or whatever it is. And so that's probably the best way that I can answer that question. Thank you. That's actually really a really helpful framing because I, I think I think I agree 100%, uh, but but I, I don't know if I've ever quite thought it <laughs> to the fullest extent there what it could um, be subtly doing. That was a learning process for me too. Yeah, because because it doesn't sound that insidious when you ask it. Um, it it, it sounds yeah. curious, but but it really can be sort of like well, yeah, it almost sounds like what's their motivation? It sounds like an interrogation, right? Um, yes, exactly. It's kind of coming from a place where you're already sitting on a on a on a judgment throne, so to speak. Right. We're ready to make a judgment depending on their answer. Right. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, when I was a Christian, I was kind of one of those weirdos that was like, um, well, I'm pro-life and conviction, but, you know, it, I'm pro-choice and application because, uh, you know, or some some toolish Bible school kid thing to say. Because <laughs> cause my reasoning was I, I was very convinced very early on and, you know, even as a teenager, I was like, the people who are getting abortions don't think it's murder. Like, I just knew that. Like, I was like, they're not, they're not going and murdering people in their head. Right. But, but I still thought they were, but I, but I felt like there was like some sort of like standard I could like adjust based on their knowledge or, you know, that was kind of, kind of how I rationed through uh, my rationale through it. And, uh, you know, I didn't vote when I was evangelical. And so like, I didn't really have a dog in the race, so to speak. Um, uh, but but I was kind of like, well, I'm I I prefer pro life, but I don't think pro choice is that bad. Can that sort of moderate worldview still be damaging, even if it's obviously like tamer than, let's say, a Planned Parenthood protester? Yeah, I think that's a good question, and the short answer is yes, it can be damaging. And the longer answer is, you know, a- anything that seeds ground to the anti choice movement is only going to add stigma to abortion seekers and to the overall discussion. And I think it's okay to be moderate in your views, but whenever we say things like, oh, I'm pro-choice, but, or, oh, I don't judge, but, you know, we're we're, we're leaving leaving room or allowing loopholes for any sort of anti-choice talking points, which they're very good at, to be planted into our perspective and thinking. And this is something that I've, uh, I've had to learn along the way, you know, things like, oh, I'm pro-choice, but not in the seventh month. Like, that's just ridiculous. And it's, uh, I've, I hear a lot of pro-choice people say that. And, um, it's, and then you, then you gotta ask yourself, what do you mean by that? Or who is getting the abortion in the seventh month? What, why do you, have you seen the statistics on who gets that and why they get it? And, why people would wait that long, quote unquote, waiting, um, as opposed to being pushed later into pregnancy because of different barriers that are in their way. And so I, I think I, I have a problem with the idea of like, you know, I, I mean, I, I also don't understand the position of I'm pro life, but I'm pro choice by, by as in practice. That's being pro choice. You, you know, whatever your, your views you hold personally. Um, you believe in the, the right for someone else to decide for themselves. I mean, essentially, that's the baseline of being pro-choice. Um, you know, there are plenty of pro-choice people who say they would not choose abortion for themselves, and that's totally fine. But they're also not going to tell other people or vote in a way that forces other people to, you know, become parents against their will and things like that. And so, yeah, there, there's there's a lot of ways that stigma can be added to abortion and. Uh, the abortion discussion. And what I've learned is that any sort of stigmatization will add to the anti-choice movement's goals. And then they use that for their own data and their talking points. And, and then mainstream media repeats it without even, you know, thinking about what they're saying. You know, they'll say things like, well, if you look at the demographics, uh, abortion is such a divisive issue. Actually, it is not. I mean, just these the most recent midterm elections proved that the the most the most winningest issue that we had in this midterm election election was abortion. Every state that had abortion on the ballot um, voted pro-choice in overwhelming measure, and not just California, which is a very democratic state, but states like Montana, Michigan, 
uh, Kentucky, um, and Vermont is, you know, pretty progressive in that, in that regard. But these, and Kansas previously in August, they had a referendum about abortion. They have passed the right to abortion, to keep abortion safe and legal and to keep it in the constitution um, overwhelmingly. And so, and that, and that's people on the right voting in that way, Republicans, conservatives, religious people. And so when you look at the actual demographics and you look at the actual data around who supported Roe v. Wade and who supports the right to have abortion, it's a majority of Americans. And so for, you know, to talk about the moderate point of view and to have that repeated in mainstream media and then to have the narrative set that, oh, it's Americans are divided, we're actually not. Because if push comes to shove, I think every person would want to have that right to make a decision for themselves. Uh, for their own pregnancy, if they're in that situation, and so, yeah, I just I think any anything that you know that is a little bit wishy washy can add stigma, and that's not to say that you can have your own compli- you can't have your own complicated feelings toward it. That's totally fine. It's it's when we start to make that a, a public conversation or a public narrative, then it becomes a way to add stigma. I totally agree. I I, I think that's I think it's not damaging in the sense that it's um that it's like so uh toxic it's that it can be used so toxically if that makes sense it it, it can be uh it can, it can that wishy-washiness and that um that it's almost like a failure to see it as a human rights issue right to see it more as like well what does everyone else think you know <laughs> which is uh majority rules is not always the most ethical and, and and of course in this country we don't even go by majority rules most of the time we go by yeah. um you know Gerrymandered yes and gerrymandered districts as well um it is encouraging though to that this past midterms was very encouraging because you did kind of see this this work <laughs> um it, you know kind of not leaving it up to the supreme court you could kind of see that we're like no we the people are saying this exactly. um and that 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 was a that was a very encouraged if there was anything encouraging about this election cycle <laughs> um that was definitely it so it's but this has obviously been going on for a long time. Um, probably when you and I were were in our evangelical days, uh, particularly our younger ones, this was more of a, um, uh, you know, I remember listening to a lot of sermons about abortion when I was like eight, you know, um, which is just kind of a wild thing to think about. Um, very wild. Yeah. But, uh, but, but, but it's because of a very long history of, it will will limit it to American history. I mean, you start going even back to ancient history and start talking about birth control and abortion. It's it's a fascinating evolution. But as far as the U.S. goes, how important, um, or even just Western countries, I guess we could say, how important is teaching the history of birth control and abortion when it comes to this discussion? It's very important, and I think um, ex evangelicals now more than ever. Um, should be looking into this history and sharing it far and wide. I think we're, we're uniquely positioned to do that. And I think there is more um, acknowledgement in the mainstream media as well. I, I'm, I'm seeing it more and more. Um, you know, the acknowledgement that the anti-abortion movement or the pro-life movement did not start with when Roe v. Wade was passed in 1973. It started because of segregation and with a different Supreme Court case called Brown versus Board of Education. The pro-life movement was created in response to the fact that um, white Christian schools were no longer allowed to segregate and to keep their tax-exempt status, they had to allow um, different races in their schools, specifically uh, black people, and they did not want to do that. And so previously to that, evangelicals were apolitical. They were not involved in the way that other people were. They just kind of kept to themselves and did their thing and focused on their goal. And then this became a galvanizing way for them to rally the troops and figure out a way to fight back against, um, you know, integration laws. And because, you know, and that was in 19, in the mid sixties, you know, the time of civil rights, but then the country was moving on the, the world's moving forward. They could no longer outwardly, you know, be racist in that way, you know, say, oh, we're against integration. And so they had to find another issue to rally around, to rally the troops that wasn't such a dog whistle. And 
you know, the moral majority and um, what's his name, Falwell's dad, Jerry Falwell Sr. and a bunch of other people, um, Francis Schaefer, Francis Schaefer and a bunch of others kind of got on this call and decided that, well, there's a few issues happening right now. And this was the 70s by then. There was the Vietnam War and um, Roe v. Wade had been passed at this point. So they're like, oh, what about abortion? Let's let's test it out. And previously, previously to that, the evangelical church had, um, you know, and then the Southern Baptist Convention and a number of other denominations had approved of the Roe v. Wade decision saying it was going to prevent you know, unnecessary deaths and, you know, back alley abortions and all this kind of stuff. So they were able to galvanize the troops around an issue that they found that could um, rally people. And that's kind of how the the pro-life movement came about. And if you look at any books or, re, or um, you know, interviews with Frank Schaefer, who was Francis Schaefer's son, he was he's a filmmaker and he was the one who made all their propaganda videos and he said it was one of the biggest regrets of his life um, playing a role in the creation of that movement because he does not think or believe that in that way at all anymore and it's it's all manufactured and it's all for political purposes and it's all for the ballot box and so now in 2022 when Roe v Wade has been overturned and they've essentially reached the goal that they had tried to do with Ronald Reagan and then with George W. Bush and, and then with Trump and and then it happened. Um, you know, it, it really is, you really see their political motivations behind it because they're also not expanding Medicare. They don't care about mental health um, access at all. They're not tackling gun deaths in the same way. You know, children being gunned down at schools. You know, that's not a, why isn't that a pro-life issue? And additionally, America has the largest, um, the highest rates of maternal mortality in the developed world. I mean, this is America. We're the most powerful country in the world. Why are mothers still dying in childbirth? Predominantly, they are black and brown mothers. That probably gives you an indication why the pro-life movement doesn't care because it was always about racism. Um, and so, you know, why isn't maternal mortality a, a pro-life issue, you know? You care so much about a fetus and a baby, why don't you care about the mother? And you begin to see the hypocrisy and just flagrant disregard for life the more you look into it, the more you look into the issue. And and so, it, you know, it made me angry for a very, very long time. But now I think because of Roe v. Wade being overturned and more people talking about the oranges, origins of the evangelical movement and the pro-life movement, people understand that, oh, okay, this was never about these honourable intentions and their moral purview, it was all about an end, you know, reaching an end goal and that goal was always political and that's why they voted for Donald Trump. And, yeah, it's 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 really interesting and I think more people should be looking into that. And the, the best place to start, um, I tell people, to Google um, uh, an article by a man named Randall Barmer, who is a professor at Dartmouth University. University, He's written a couple of books about this, but he wrote a really great article on Politico called The Real Origins of the Religious Right. So all you have to do is Google a Randall Barmer Politico article, which I do when I forget the title, and it'll come up. And it, it's, I believe it's an excerpt from his book, which I also have. Um, and it's just a really great uh, way to start that journey of learning about the origins of this issue and why it became such a big one for the evangelical church because it was always a catholic issue and um you know it had always been part of that tradition and their political activism but the evangelical church really took it and ran with it and led with it and still does to this day in many ways Uh, i think what the catholic church does well they may not be as vocal as the evangelicals but they are very well funded they they do the funding really well um so yeah i would encourage anyone to everyone to look into that history i'm smiling so big because that article is what changed my mind about so many things um randall bomber is incredible um i remember the first time i read that article I've, i've reread it several times since um it is just such a succinct understandable um like summation of of all this stuff that is easily verifiable i mean you don't have to even dig far to to you know what's funny though i was thinking about this while you were talking about how clearly there's this this has the pro-life movement has a very racist history 
what's funny is the gaslighting that comes with that, right? Is uh, because I remember at a very young age hearing, well, abortion was started to kill black people. You know, that was kind of like the the thing that they were telling me. Um, and there's really, it's really hard to debunk it in the sense that, look, we're dealing with a racist country <laughs> where where bad things happened, and they can pull some real quotes or some real, you know, thoughts and kind of run with it. Um, so you definitely have to, to to talk about the history in a much more nuanced and like full way than simply saying, well, this one racist was a proponent of abortion. That's not that's not really uh, the reality. Right. How about birth control? How do you think that factors into this discussion? Yeah, birth control is an interesting one because, I mean, it revolutionized the world and specifically women's lives and the economy and this country in so many ways. But there is a very dark and racist history associated with the origins of birth control um, in America specifically. I can't talk to other countries, obviously, but the way that it was tested on Puerto Rican women, poor Puerto Rican women, um, a number of whom died, um, and, but that was okay for the white medical establishment that was like collateral damage to them because they didn't want to test it on the white women. They wanted to make sure they, you know, targeted marginalized women first and then figured out how to make it a viable product and and to make it profitable. And to this day, there are still a lot of um, side effects of certain types of um, certain methods of birth control that um, are being exposed, you know, in in the pharmaceutical realm and um, you know, just impact on people's lives. There's an there's a interesting documentary called The Business of Birth Control uh, made by the same people that made The Business of Birth, uh, Ricky Lake and Abby Epstein, which is a very fascinating documentary and I, I definitely recommend people watch it. There's a lot of nuanced conversations and it, it makes a lot of feminists angry because they're like, you know, you can't be disparaging birth control, it's empowerment and da-da-da, which it is, yes. And, uh, you know, the vast majority of people who use birth control um, are not harmed, but there are enough stories and enough anecdotes and enough data out there to recognize that it can be harmful and, and it, its origins have been harmful to entire demographics of people, specifically marginalized and black and brown people. And so it's important to look into that. Um, and also on a much bigger scope, the way the white medical establishment looks at issues of health and turns it into a profitable um, landscape rather than a patient-centered approach. And one of the other areas that I can point to that proves this is the midwifery profession, for example. Um, before it was, um, you know, integrated into healthcare and it was a, you know, a viable profession where you can make a profit, it was majority um, black women, black enslaved women who were midwives and wet nurses and who cared for white people's babies and, um they were the ones who were very good at their jobs. They, you know, rarely lost children in childbirth because they knew what they were doing. Um, but then when the when childbirth became a hospitalized um, job rather than something you do at home, the white medical establishment and male establishment realized, oh, this can be profitable. Let's take it away from the homes and take it away from the women who have been um, – you know, taking charge of this issue and leading on this issue, which were predominantly black women, and let's criminalize it. And so that is what happened in many states. And in some states in the South, um, you know, you can, as a midwife who does home births, you can potentially still face criminal charges if you are, you know, not connected to a hospital or you're not certified in a certain way or, you know, all these different factors that can come into play. And so the, the fact that midwifery became a for-profit venture rather than, oh, we want to make sure we have the healthiest babies and the healthiest mothers and the healthiest environment, again, shows that things like birth control and childbirth and any sort of reproductive issue, it's all down to profit. It's all, um, you know, profitable off the backs of black and brown women and marginalized people. And, And so there's, yeah, there's that dark history that cannot be separated from the way the healthcare system is today and there's there's so many problems with it we're not where it it ideally should be you know there are so many other countries that are much further ahead than what we are and we're still just trying to get a damn bill passed you know to expand medicare and um in many states and so yeah i think you know when you look at birth control it's important to recognize that and 
I mean, there are so many other ways which the medical system profited off the back of um, black and brown bodies too. I mean, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment is another one. Um, the way that the quote unquote godfather of gynecology, his name's J. Marion Sims, there was a statue of him in, in New York, which recently got pulled down. He would experiment. He was a white man um, and he was a slave owner. He would experiment on uh, three black enslaved women without anesthesia because the the racist idea was that our oh, black bodies don't feel pain the way other bodies do and just all these hideous ideas. And so he would, you know, do these experiments and then, and then you know, he's now heralded as this medical hero, but actually the heroes should be those three women that he experimented on because, you know, they survived and they people know about their stories and they were able to tell their stories. And, and so, you know, you cannot separate this the medical issue, the healthcare system from racism at all in this country. That was a very long-winded answer. <laughs> no, that was so important because it's so, it's, in my opinion, it's just so central to um, to debunking erroneous arguments from, from different movements. Um, obviously, it's very upsetting. I, I've joked before that like uh, a lot of U.S. history is arguments from different white nationalists arguing about how you should be a white nationalist. And and it and it and it and it's very true. You're not gonna find um when you go back in American history heroes. <laughs> You're just not. Um the people you think I mean, there's some, absolutely, like you were saying, those three women. But but when you're talking about the people in power, you're gonna get uh bad turns in your stomach when you read some of the quotes. Even p- even beloved figures like Abraham Lincoln, you read how nas- you know, racist he was, and you're like, what? And uh it, it can be very frightening, but I think those conversations are very relevant because it gives credence to the fact that we're aiming at truth here and we're aiming at, at human love and human rights. Um, and we're not aiming at just like a, a political angle like you've brought up before. The, and there and there's an even present day, right? There's still so many stigmas attached to this. You know, we have stigma around miscarriage, stigma around adoption, medical issues, mental <laughs> issues, you know. Uh, let's say unmarried parents or um, infertility uh, people who aren't able to have children. There's stigma around that, right? Or or even people who don't want children, exactly, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and and all of this probably you could point back if you wanted to simplify it into a few terms. It, it's certainly prescribed by a certain kind of patriarchal, heteronormative, nuclear family encouragement in American culture. Definitely. So, do you think? reproductive rights would even be a discussion in a more open-minded or uh, equitable society? Well, I, I think the problem with reproductive rights is that it's a legal framework and it doesn't go far enough. And one of the things that I've um, really learned to do, you know, in shifting my way of thinking is looking at the reproductive justice movement, because it is a human rights approach, like you've been saying, where reproductive rights can be a right in name only. So if they, you, you know you go somewhere and they say, oh, abortion's legal, okay, but there's, there are no clinics and there are no providers and um, there's no healthcare access. Well, if a right is a right in name only, is it a right? You know, if there's no provision, if there's no justice and human rights approach to this issue. Um, and so, you know, and with the reproductive justice movement, it was created by a number of um, black women leaders in the early 90s in response to the Clinton administration because they felt that although it was a democratic administration, they weren't going far enough to address the systemic issues that black and brown women were facing, uh, you know, incarceration, lack of access to, um, you know, clean and healthy food. Uh, food deserts is a real issue in this country. Um, healthcare access, education, um, all of these things that allow someone to raise a child in a healthy and supportive environment. And so reproductive justice leaders decided that it's not just about abortion. It's about the right to parent or not to parent and to be able to do that with safety and security and with support. Um, and then once you see that shift in framework, you realize, oh, this is a much bigger landscape that we've got to be looking at. And it's, it is a justice centered approach. It, it looks at any sort of reproductive issue as, um, a human rights issue rather than one that should be won and fought for in just the political arena. I mean, you said it before, the Supreme Court does not have the final word uh, on abortion in this country. There are people in droves going out for uh, ballot measures and referendum votes in this country today and deciding that, no, we want to have abortion access. 
And so when you look at it from a justice point of view, it, it really shifts your way of thinking. And so that's kind of um, where I'm at today. So reproductive rights is important. The legal fights are very, very important. And we need to have those, but it's got to go much further than that. I hope that answers your question. I actually can't remember the question. Really? <laughs> no, that, that, that was, that's actually a way better way to reframe it than where my train of thought was. <laughs> because, okay. yeah, the, because, because rights are, you know, we like to pretend they're inalienable, but they're very alienable. <laughs> they are determined by people with power. It depends on your zip code, your age, yeah. your socioeconomic status, like all those things. And so rights don't go far enough, I don't think. I, I agree. I mean, especially when you talk about constitutional rights, because frankly, constitutional rights are for white landowning men. At least exactly. that's how the constitution was written. So that's uh, that doesn't even include me. I don't own any land. So, you know, that's that's a very narrow group. So but it's so, yeah, it's definitely a larger topic, let's say. So is it is it a fundamental human justice issue or human right issue in the sense um that everyone should have the right to either reproduce or not re- reproduce and 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 this is a I, I I don't know how to phrase this better um but are are there more rights to let's say the person giving birth than the uh, inseminator Yeah that's a that's a two part question for sure um <sighs> I think I'll answer that second part first. Are there more rights to the person? And it's funny because I was recently doing an interview um, with someone who works at the the Male Contraceptive Institute and they use the terms egg producer and sperm producer because they're being very gender inclusive. So I I love these terms. Um, But I think the person who is pregnant will always have more, should always have more of the decision because it is happening in their body. I mean, it's such a profound and, massive change um, and potentially trauma that's happening in their lives, in their body, in their mental health. And that's not to say that the inseminator or the sperm producer shouldn't have any say. I think it depends on the situation. You know, for me, I am married to a man and we made these decisions together and I'm very lucky to have that support system. Not everyone is in that situation and they shouldn't be forced to, you know, consult with people that are not in their safety circle or their, or their circle of support. You know, there are states that are forcing um, people who want to get abortions to consult with their rapists or get their rapists' um, permission. It's like that is just so hideous in so many ways. It's just it's just so bonkers to me that, you know, those kind of laws are allowed or those kind of situations are allowed. Uh, and so that's not a justice-centered approach at all. And I think that's why you can't make one overarching law because everyone's situation, everyone who gets pregnant, their situation is so different that we cannot legislate. Possi- there is no one way we can possibly legislate that encompasses all of those situations. So I think the if the default way is to allow that pregnant person to make that decision with this right support that they can access and that they need that that's always going to be the best way forward and when you look at countries that don't have any um federal abortion laws like canada for example um, or the state of new york that doesn't have any sort of criminalized they, they've taken um, abortion out of their criminal code and put it into the health code they did that in 2018 with the reproductive health act the data shows that when you when abortion becomes a health issue as opposed to a potentially legal or criminalized issue and you also simultaneously have access to birth control to sex education to healthcare. you see lower rates of um uh, lower rates of abortion you see lower rates of um, maternal mortality and infant mortality and you see better um, mental and maternal health outcomes and so for me it's a no-brainer like that uh, abortion shouldn't be legislated in a way that potentially has criminal elements. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that going back to your question of the inseminator, I think they, they, sh- they should and they can have rights. It just depends on the, you know, the situation. I don't think there's one law that can possibly encompass, you know, one, or one opinion, like my opinion could possibly encompass um, all of those situations um, because everyone's life is so nuanced. And then I forgot the first half of your question. <laughs> You'll have to talk no, about that, it. 
<laughs> no, I, I think you actually did answer it by accident. So uh, just talking about kind of whether it is fundamental to be able to produce or even not reproduce, because, you know, this isn't a law anymore. But, you know, China had the, I, I believe, the one child rule or yeah. two child rule for a long time. Yeah. Um, and that could definitely be considered like a reproductive rights issue. Um, Absolutely. So, so I was just wondering kind of how is it essential? I, I think justice is about I want to. The, the, I don't mean right in the legal sense. I mean, is it a fundamental human right at, in yeah. as much as like the, you know, in my opinion, freedom of speech? I don't have that because the government tells me I have freedom of speech. I have freedom of speech because I'm speaking right now. Right. Um, right. You know, is, is reproductive rights that fundamental? Yes. The answer is definitely yes. And And you gave a great example of what happens when the government makes overarching decisions about our reprodu- everyday reproductive lives you know, through the one child policy, it still impacts people in China to this day. I mean, there were so many clandestine abortions, not just because of the the law itself, but because there's also a, this patriarchal mindset that boys are, baby boys are worth more than baby girls. And because they were only allowed to have one child legally, when they found out they were having girls, they would either give them up and, and you know, discard them, or they would you know, go and have secret abortion so they can get pregnant again and have a boy and have this child that is more valued in society. And so, again, it's connected to so many of these other issues. But now, because of the aging population, China is now, I think they have a three-child policy. And at this point, I'm just like, just stop making policies about how many children they can have. How about that? (laughs) I believe they're now in a three-child policy landscape where they're experiencing um, a huge uh, boom for fertility treatments and IVF. And it's just really fascinating to see what happens when a government makes very specific and overarching decisions. And, you know, I think that's, I think that's a dangerous uh, precedent to set because it always goes hand in hand with other things like gender roles and patriarchy and inequality in, in other, in other respects. So, yeah, I think People should have that fundamental right regardless. I mean, I believe that it's it's the UN and the World Health Organization that believe abortion is a is a fundamental human right and should remain safe and legal and accessible. And I agree with that because when you look at the data in places where it has been like it has been like that, it is accessible along with healthcare and all these other things that I mentioned before, you see people thriving and people making the best decisions um, for themselves. And it's not, it doesn't become this weaponized political issue. People are able to live their lives in safety and support. And it doesn't have to be like, let the government figure out infrastructure and roads and taxes and stuff like that. The government doesn't need to be telling us what to do with our bodies. Like, it's ridiculous. But right now in America, we're seeing that not just with reproductive issues, but with trans youth, um, with, you know, so many different healthcare issues. It's It's really, really terrifying. And and so, yeah, I think we can look to countries like Canada, and, and no country is perfect, by the way, but when you look at what Canada did, I think it's a good model of what could be um, here and, you know, what could happen. Absolutely. Let's connect this a bit more to the uh, evangelical cult, as I like to call it. Um it, you know, as we've already talked about, it's well documented that uh, evangelicals are largely responsible for the so-called pro-life movement we've mentioned jerry falwell you can also talk about bob jones um you know who are just against integration of any kind especially especially um when it comes to interracial marriage um so is there any way for evangelicals to kind of acknowledge that history and still remain evangelical well that's a tough one i i don't know for me the answer would be no and I chose to extricate myself from that environment but I think there are some well-meaning people who want to create change from within Um, and I think that's a a noble goal to have but unless we see fundamental changes happen at the top of the structure because it is a hierarchy it's not a democracy really when you look at the evangelical structures of power unless we see those um, power structures change completely from you know from top to bottom I don't know if it's possible long term and I would love to be proved wrong 
um, because I think there are a lot of people who still hold on to their faith traditions from the evangelical world and still believe what they believe, but they just don't like the political aspect. And it, it really grieves them and it breaks their heart to see that they had to walk away because their values, their you know intrinsic faith and religious values don't line up with the ch- what the church itself is doing. Um, and I think that's that's hard for many people to see. Um, it, it, it you know it breaks my heart a little bit too. It made me angry, and then for me, the best decision was just to walk away and, and realize that a power structure doesn't define who I am as a person of faith or spirituality. And um, and it wasn't my fight to make change from within, but for some people, it is. So I don't know. I think it's t- t- depends on the individual. But I personally, as a cynic and skeptic. Um, don't necessarily see it happening i mean i think the thing that i think about more than anything is the way that the um that access hollywood tape came out about donald trump and they still voted for him and it's like you know things that herschel walker is saying all these awful candidates are saying about um you know rape or incest or child marriage and they just don't care whether they hear personal stories or you know things that are horrible they just don't care like when Lindsey Graham was talking at you know gave a press conference about why he wants to put a um 15 week limit on abortion nationwide and he stood up with a whole bunch of anti-choice leaders and there was a woman in the crowd who stood up and gave her heartbreaking story of why she had to get an abortion past 15 weeks and you know, she, it was a wanted pregnancy and she almost died and it was just so heartbreaking to hear. All he did was like look at her and just go, yep, yep, yep. Well, anyway, so this is why we're doing this because blah, 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 blah. And he just did not give a sh. And so I, as much as I fully believe in the power of storytelling and, you know, whether it's through film or a podcast or giving your testimony in a press conference, it's, you know, it's powerful more for other people hearing, but there are people in power who just don't care. And so for me, I see the most effective ways creating our own sense of power elsewhere and, you know, taking the power away from those original power structures by leaving and saying, well, we don't owe you anything and you don't control us and we're going to create our own way through the world. And that's just my opinion. I mean, maybe maybe you think differently and maybe others will think differently, but it's just so hard for me to see the evidence of it changing, you know, like all these reports from the Southern Baptist Convention and, and you know, reports of sexual assault and sexual abuse. Like, has anything changed? Or do people, do they just send out these pastors on a sabbatical for three months and then, oh, here they are back again. They've written a book and now they're platformed again. And <laughs> it just, I just don't see any remorse, so. Yeah, you almost have to find the comedy in it because you're just like, really? Again? Like, y'all haven't learned a thing? Yeah, I I, I share that cynicism. Um, I also share that kind of uh, heartbreaking because I, I remember back to when I was evangelical, right? And I'm like, I, I wanted to be part of some change, you know? Like, I, I, was, I, thought, I thought the church had gone wrong in, in some areas. You know, they, they weren't necessarily um politically framed in my mind but i was like we seem to be focusing on other people's sin more than loving them you know that was kind of like my my thought and i was like well maybe i can be part of the change and then you know pretty quickly i realized oh like the smallest church with one pastor can have a structure where his power is more important than anything um and and what you're really dealing with is, is that cult like hierarchy that's kind of unbreakable. I don't I don't think there is a way to change it without becoming them, <laughs> you know, and and like without becoming uh too powerful, without becoming just a different leader who has you know uh, maybe some better ideas, because evangelicalism is ad- adaptable. It's adapted so much over the past fifty years, sixty years. It just doesn't adapt on any moral ground it adapts based on what gives them power and 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 i think that was proven very clearly with trump um with the with the access hollywood video especially um you know it just became obvious it it became it became obvious that as as far as the institutional element of evangelicalism there is no change that can happen you know and i'll go further (laughs) um i believe evangelicals continue to push this anti-abortion agenda because uh, they're patriarchal. They're homophobic. They're 
white supremacist in in dogma and you know in their beliefs and in their practice um and and a reproductive justice would necessarily compete with that mindset is is it really that bad or or are these just misinformed people who think it's you know um genocide of infants you know <laughs> are they really just just trying to protect babies no i don't think they believe that at all because if they really believe that a baby's life is so worthy and valuable then why aren't they denouncing mass shootings and why aren't they pushing for stricter gun laws and the and why aren't they talking more about the fact that so many toddlers are killed by guns because they get their hands on it accidentally because there aren't, aren't strict enough laws to lock up guns in, in in certain places and it's just there is no way that they can frame this issue that now I believe what they're saying that they care about the fetus because they don't you know they'll they'll weapon they're very good at weaponizing and very good at messaging for their brand but they're not very good at walking the talk and you know that is evident in and their power structure is and it all comes down to patriarchy exactly as you said and it's about patriarchy it's about power it's about control and the way you do that is by subjugating especially the most marginalized and most vulnerable of people which is you know pregnant women <laughs> pregnant people and um young people and and you know people who are immigrants and who don't have the same status as a white man in power at a, at a pulpit so no i i just don't think that that power structure it's like that power structure has to completely obliterate um but at the same time it's like well what's going to be left in that that way because that's going to leave a is that going to leave some sort of a power vacuum or you know, do we have, do we need something to replace it? Or, you know, like the more that I think about the idea of organized religion now that I'm out of that mindset is like, why do we need one person or a handful of people telling us how to interpret a religious text? Like, why can't we just do it for ourselves and choose what we want to read and how we feel? And why can't we have intuition be our leader and our guide as opposed to a person because we're all flawed and you know they'll they'll, they'll say that from the pulpit oh we're, we're, no one's perfect everyone's a sinner but I really don't think that they are uh, when it comes down to it some of those you know leaders that like to exert that power and control and authority especially the ones that cozy up to political leaders I think they love all that stuff and you know, if anyone's seen that God forbid documentary on Hulu about Jerry Falwell Jr. and his whole fall from grace and Liberty University, it's like that is it in a nutshell. That's just one slice of the evangelical ecosystem, power ecosystem, that he's just that one person. But there's so many people like him that are still out there and still doing their thing. And so, you know, personally, I, I don't think that I, I don't want to – I. You know, I'm I'm not the kind of person that wants to fight it because I just don't care enough anymore. I don't, they don't have any sort of control over my life, but I don't see them changing anytime soon. I mean, there aren't even. I mean, you know, when you look at the the way that they're treating someone like Beth Moore, who is white, but but she's a woman, but she's read in read. She's written decades of books. She's a teacher. She's lauded the world over, and yet. Some of them really, really hate her because she has done things. Well, first of all, she's a woman and a lot of people don't like women preaching, but the fact that she has tried to call in her fellow pastors and people in power and say like, hey, we need to really get back to the spirit of Jesus and you know the way we treat people and the sexual abuse issue and they have shut her down so quickly and shunned her and ostracized her and called her out and it's like, if they can treat someone like Beth Moore that way, there is no hope for the the the, uh, the structure the way it is for it to ever change. Like, if she can't change them, then no, they can just they can just all you know have their own little power structures together, and then the rest of us should just walk away because it's that's just my opinion. I don't think it's it's worth it. I think it's better putting our energies into our own lives and into communities in a way that we can see the intrinsic value and we can see the impact um, that's happening in a positive way rather than feeding into a structure that is based on racism and money and power. Absolutely. And and following Jesus shouldn't come with this 
feeding a narcissist, right? Like, and and that's exactly. kind of what evangelicals are banking on. Um, yeah. and and that and because I I do I do focus my attention on evangelical leaders, cult leaders, as I call them, versus cult followers. I view them more as victims a lot of the time. Um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. And, and yes, there, there's so many case studies. I mean, you can look at how they treated Rob Bell for just suggesting maybe hell wasn't quite what they say it is. And boom, he's cast off. You know, you can see it. The, the most obvious example is it, from history. And that comes to mind is how they treated Martin Luther King Jr., who was right. very Christian, <laughs> you know, um, right. and like a pastor and, and even in some ways problematic. Um, but like was not problematic in the way that was okay to, uh, you know, patriarchal white supremacist mindset. So, you know, let me, let me put on my conspiracy hat and just go one step further. So some more extreme evangelicals, this is by no means everyone. Um, but there's movements such as the quiverful movement, right. Or like these like kind of odd subsections of evangelicalism that teach that you should have a lot of kids. Like they'll, they'll say like, you should have as many kids as you possibly can. And that's how we'll convert the next generation is by indoctrinating eight to 12 to 15 kids. And that's how we'll raise an army of the Lord. Um, could that play into anti-abortion advocacy? Um, I think so. I mean, that I only know on the periphery about um, the quiverful movement, um, but it's really interesting to see people who came from that. Like there's uh, one of my friends, Ashley Easter, um, who many people know, she's a, an amazing speaker and leader and talks about abuse now and she came from that movement and she you know talks a lot about the damaging aspects of it but I think the in terms of it's it's much bigger than just the anti-abortion it's they're you know really are creating armies for the Lord by raising up these children and but you know the statistics are probably going to bear out that many of these kids that grow up in those families are going to end up walking away and then or there we're going to see horrible stories like what's happening with the Duggar family and abuse and just really, really awful stuff. And, you know, there, there's no sort of healthy idea of sexuality and relationships. It's just fall in line, do this thing, follow the rules and everything will be okay. But, and then sweep everything else under the carpet. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it definitely plays into the anti-abortion movement, but also because they want the anti-abortion, abortion movement wants more white babies. They don't necessarily want to see more black and brown babies or immigrant babies. And even though they'll weaponize like, you know, this idea of, oh, you know, it's genocide, they'll use triggering terms like, oh, it's genocide against black babies. They don't care about black babies. Do they know that in pl- in, in parts of, um, in, in cities like in, in Jackson and Mississippi that a lot of people don't have clean drinking water and the and predominantly those people are um, black and brown children well what are they doing about that they don't care about black babies at all and so it's it really is about the heteronormative white patriarchal structure and and control is the way to maintain that i think so i i, I agree completely um Asha, this is a hard conversation, but it's a very important conversation. So thank you for coming on to talk about it. Um, I want to give you the floor to, I'm especially curious about the documentary you're producing. So if you would talk about that and then tell the people uh, where they can find out more about you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm currently in post-production on a documentary called Someone You Know, and the tagline is Three Women, Three Decisions, One Hostile Landscape. It profiles three women who had abortions later in pregnancy. Um, it debunks the, the term late-term abortion, which is the anti-choice propaganda term. But more than anything, it, it really humanizes who the people are that are getting abortions so late in pregnancy and why, and the barriers that are put in their way and why why a lot of people are pushed into pregnancy because of the anti-choice barriers and laws. Um, and so we're aiming to release that on June 24th, 2023, which is the one-year anniversary of Roe v. Wade being overturned. Um, so I filmed interviews and I'm using a lot of animation to retell the, um, the majority of these women's stories. And um, yeah, I just finished doing a Kickstarter and now I'm continuing to raise money because production is expensive and films are <laughs> independent films are expensive. And so now I'm beginning the storyboard process of sketching out the animation, but we have a trailer, uh, and the best way to find all of that info is on my website, www.ashadaya.com. You can follow me on social media. I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Asha Dyer. 
You can check out girltalkhq.com. Um, if you have a story to share and you want to, um, you know, write an article or, or tell me about what you're doing and that's awesome and badass and inspiring, um, hit me up. Uh, check out girltalkhq.com. I always love to amplify people's um, personal stories. And then you can check out my book, Today's Wonder Women Um, There's an audible version and the physical version. So that's me in a nutshell. And um, yeah, come and hit me up and get in touch and, and um, let's stay connected. Thank you so much for coming on. And I'm just so honored that you were willing to come on. It really, uh, I, I've been wanting to talk about this for a long time. And I feel like you covered so much so eloquently on on a tough issue that's that's hard to talk about um and uh and i'm so glad you're able to amplify stories that um you know are hard for a lot of people to talk to talk about so i'm sure like you've had to provide a lot of safety and and do a lot of hard work to um destigmatize these stories and use them um in a really important way so that humanity uh gets a little better than we are right now yeah, thank you. I think storytelling is a really powerful way to disrupt culture and, and potentially change hearts and minds and challenge our way of thinking. And so that's what I hope my film, Someone You Know, will do. And, and even if it becomes a resource for someone to share with their family member or help someone feel less alone in their stories, I think while I was doing the Kickstarter, I had so many women and mothers reach out to me saying, Oh my gosh, thank you for making this film. I, that this happened to me. I've had to go through the same thing and it was heartbreaking. And so I, I'm just, I really see the value in, in personal storytelling um, in any form. And so I, and especially in the ex evangelical community, there's, there are so many wonderful platforms like this podcast where you can share your story and share your truth, if, truth, if that's something you're comfortable doing. And it, it helps us all connect and, and uh, see each other more as human beings rather than just data points or statistics or, you know, people in a different tribal aspect of the world. And so, yeah, I agree. Storytelling is powerful. Absolutely. And you tell them well. So thank you. And uh, thank you, listener, for stopping by. I will talk to you all soon. If you'd like to learn more about this podcast or other work I'm doing, go to thecultofchristianity.com. If you'd like to support this podcast, listen, follow, share, and consider subscribing for $5 through Spotify for additional content, or give as much or as little as you can to support this work through links in the show's notes. Every dollar helps further this important discussion as well as start other exciting projects. Thanks for listening, and remember to keep love in your life, hope in your heart, and searching in your soul.